Every Yu-Gi-Oh! Ace card explained in Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds by TGS Anime. I absolutely love this series that TGS Anime has been putting out in regards to Ace cards in comparison to Boss Monsters, breaking down the anime, as I've had a couple streams where I've gotten a little little salty, a little tilted, if you will, in regards to Master Duel. Somebody that loves Yu-Gi-Oh! at the very least on a casual level, it's awesome, and I love it. And I love going back through the anime, and I love that we have creators like TGS Anime that recognize the anime where a lot of people a lot of channels just recognize the competitive aspect of it or they'll focus on it deck profiles pack openings etc it's really good to see someone going back and paying attention to series that deserve a lot of love and i've heard a lot of good things about 5ds i have not watched it extensively especially past season one just due to airings and stuff like that working however i've heard it's a very very good series and right off the bat if this content does interest you you should absolutely check out tgs anime but without further ado into it ace cards the cards that carries and carries with them for all time despite how much their deck may change over the course of the series mm -hmm. today i'm going to take a look at every ace card that was seen in the Yu-Gi-Oh! 5d's anime let's start first with the core cast the signers you say fudo now if you've been keeping i mean you say is going to be one of those that stardust is probably going to be on there in regards to ace monsters but I could see an argument being made for something like maybe like Junk Synchron or something like that. Like, it's kind of like how it, with Yugi, it ended up being like Dark Magician with Sub Dark Magician Girl with Sub Karibo. And then we went to Jaden Yuki and GX, where Jaden Yuki was technically a toss up between like Neos and Flame Wingman, but you had Wing Karibo in there. But you could technically make an argument for Ubel. You could make an argument for Polymerization. You know, there's just so much that you can make arguments for you know as far as i know on you say specifically i think stardust is going to be pretty cut and dry it's technically boss monster territory at least for the through the earlier arcs and you know obviously it has upgraded forms from there i'm trying to remember i think it was mostly junk synchron how he got to it on on it early and up with this series you will know main characters tend to have <coughs> a few potential ace monsters you say fudo he keeps things simple. There are only two possible candidates for Yusei's ace. Junk Warrior Stardust. Junk Warrior yeah. and Stardust Dragon. Yeah. At the start of the series, Yusei's first ace before he got his Stardust Dragon back was his Junk Warrior, which was a dark synchro monster that had the ability that when it was summoned, it would gain attack equal to the attack of all the level two monsters on the field. This monster represents a part of Yusei's personality. It is the aspect of unity and friendship can overcome anything and this is what this effect is it's using other monsters to boost itself up right just like you say and let's be honest with ourselves junk warrior this monster pretty much is you say you say is a character that emerged from the junk pile of the under city that he lived in to become a hero of the people i think with that in mind it really was a mature a mature plot point like didn't he get thrown into prison in like the first five episodes let, and then you had obviously Jack Atlas moving on, and you know, uh, was it Roman Torchwick? No, that's Ruby. I can't remember his name. It was Roman something, right? But you had just so many more adult plot points. Uh, we had, you know, obviously sidekicks, which we get to Akiza. You know, sidekicks were canon, which technically, I mean, we've had dual spirits since dual monsters, realistically, right? And like, you know, Akiza going through what training and schooling that she did. That was. It, 5Ds is one of those I will probably really enjoy going through. Mind, just because a monster is representative of you doesn't necessarily mean it is your ace card. No. Because that's where we get to, yeah, let's be honest ourselves. You say it's real ace card. Stardust Dragon. A level 8 wind synchro monster and one of the destined signer dragons to be wielded by a signer. While Yusei does believe in the power of friendship and teamwork to rise up against any challenge, he also believes he needs to protect everyone as well. And how can he protect people? With his monster's effects. Yeah. Stardust has the ability that when a card would be destroyed on the field, it contributes itself to negate that destruction. And then during the end phase, it'll come back to the field. There's a lot of obvious reasons why this monster is his ace. Like with all of the main characters, they all have a 2500 attack yeah. point main monster as their ace monster this monster fits that bill but more so this card was originally owned by his dad mr fudo and then mr fudo everything went pear-shaped and then he got three of them and he gave three of them to i think it was roman goodwin roman goodwin put them out into circuit goodwin there we go god i couldn't remember the name of him 
circulation into the real world. And then somehow in the circulation, it ended up getting back to Yusei. So that just makes sense that this card was always meant to be wielded by him. And the fact that this monster has like a million different upgraded forms, Axel, Synchro, and so-and-so stuff. It just yeah. makes sense. Stardust Dragon is Yusei's ace monster. Dude and Quasar still sees play to this day, especially in decks that can uh, Synchro climb actually quite nutty and don't worry about them boss monsters we'll cover them in a future boss monster video jack atlas it's red dragon archfiend what else is it gonna be it yeah i mean like there's really no contest on that like you have you know a bunch of upgraded forms of red dragon archfiend but you think jack atlas you you see red dragon archfiend for all intents and purposes i really can't contest this even with my limited knowledge of 5d specifically at least the anime as far as that's concerned I really can't contest this. If you're referring to a monster as my... Let me get that exact quote. The ruler's heartbeats will now file through here. Take witness to the creation shaking power. I synchro summon my very soul, Red Demon's Dragon. Red Dragon Archfiend. Yeah. Now, if you're referring to a monster as your very soul, it's your ace monster. And as such, this monster is a perfect representation of Jack Atlas because Jack wants to be the king. He needs power in order to achieve that. And so this monster has the effect that if it attacks defense position monster, it just destroys every defense position monster on the field. And not only that, at the end of the turn, if monsters didn't attack, they blow themselves up. For the signers, it's actually kind of easy to pin down their ace monsters. They're all the yeah. signer dragons. Yeah. They all their decks are working towards this monster. And for a lot of the characters, this is their ace and boss monster. This is actually why I like Yu-Gi-Oh! in terms of, at least as of GX. Well, I mean, we've actually, I guess back in Duel Monsters as well, that their ace monsters are what you see them paired with a lot of the time, or even what they're using at the time is very reflective of who their character is. And going back through, I mean... I've watched some pretty weird anime duels, let's be real. And there's no way a deck construction like that would really work. I mean, there you're going to have things that come into play, right? And it's going to be, you know, well, how do you have Neospatians combining with elemental heroes, combining with generic good stuffs, as I'll call it, right? How do you have all that meshing together? How do you have Ojamas and old armed dragons and the... Um, the beetle uh, rich uh, union archetype and, you know, XYZ or VW XYZ dragon catapult can online in the same deck, right? You, you just, for all intents and purposes, you really don't. Yes, GX was the advent of archetypes, right? Back in Duel Monsters, we had, you know, you know, Yugi would summon Dark Magician, which had no affiliation with Buster Blader. You know, what you had adjacent Dark Magician girl that fed into Dark Magician, and you had things like Celtic Guardian, Noxious Celtic Guardian, the upgraded form, right? But there was kind of a mishmash because that was just early Yu-Gi-Oh. That's how the how the game was. It wasn't until GX, you know, we had heroes, right? It was kind of start the advent of the normalization of archetypes in Yu-Gi-Oh, right? And, you know, we had heroes further uh, down to elemental heroes, destiny heroes, my personal favorite, evil heroes, which is incredibly undersupported. And, you know, things like cyber angel, I guess, well, technically cyber, like cyber dragons, cydras, those have been going pretty strong. And sub cyber dark, right? Red eyes, even red eyes got more support. And coming back around from that point, kind of giving examples of the archetype, is that it shows what, how a character is feeling or what they kind of represent. So when you look at it, right, you're like, none of this would make sense. But if you start looking at it through a narrative lens, right, like, let's take, you know, Jaden, Yuki, well, let's, let's even go back further than that, actually. Let's go Seto Kaiba versus, you know, like, Yugi, right? And, you know, you're going to have those moves right where yugi's going to use magical hats and that is him providing an answer to kaiba's bid for power his you know his direct attack if you will or his attack on yugi and you know his magical hats is his way of responding to that it is something that he knows it is the ability to do it given kind of form by the card game itself right yes you physically are using the card to do something but from a narrative standpoint this is how yugi will respond to situations whereas somebody like jaden yuki if jaden yuki is being attacked by uh, i don't know say paradox from the movie right what's he going to do he's going to use hero barrier he has a hero on the field he's going to protect his heroes versus someone with using you know you say right you know someone activates an effect say someone activates rageki dark hole etc and you say is going to sacrifice the stardust dragon to save everyone else he's going to sacrifice himself put himself 
you know, <laughs> behind to make sure everyone else is safe. And it's really the com combination of a mechanical game, mechanically sound games in a lot of cases, combined with a narrative storytelling like that. That's just amazing. Notice when you go through GX, right? Jaden has his elemental heroes. And then after he loses, the light of destruction tries to just claim him and it, and it doesn't work. You know, he ends up going to Neo Space and he gets his Neo Spatians, right? And that showcases a more, you know, childlike Jaden, a new, a reforged Jaden. And then you get to Supreme King Jaden arc, where, yes, he does have his elemental heroes, but now they're combined into twisted versions of themselves. You have evil hero Infernal, uh, Infernal Gainer, which is going to be kind of the. That one's actually seen a lot of contention. I think a lot of people have said it's. It's not Spark Man. It's not Necroshade because we got Necro, uh, Sinister Necrom later, but that's not anime. Anyways, right? You have things like Dark Gaia. You have things like Infernal Wing. You have things like uh, Wild Cyclone, right? And those are the corrupted versions of that, which is just so cool from a storytelling perspective. And really, a lot more series could pick up cues like that. It doesn't necessarily, circling all the way back, it doesn't have to necessarily make sense especially when you look at it through the lens of this is entertainment. This is not characters using a playing a game. It is characters, yes, playing a game, but having conflict with each other, if that makes sense. So yeah, you're going to have Chaz as Chaz evolves. He's going to get less serious. He's going to use his Ojamas more, even to the point that he defeats Aster Phoenix with Ojama Yellow, right? Which is a far cry from season one, where he, you know, Crowler gave him VW XYZ Dragon Catapult Cannon and was just absolutely wiping the floor with people, right? So there's layers is really what it comes down to. And it doesn't necessarily have to make sense, but it just has to make sense from a narrative standpoint. And the card game is a medium to tell this story. The only two I would say that have upgraded forms of their aces into boss monsters are Jack and Yusei. This kind of reminds me of how in Digimon, Ty and Matt were the only ones to get mega evolutions with War Greymon and- I remember those. Oh no, the other one, the metal wolf looking thing. That one, anyway. The rest of the cast didn't really get any upgrades, so it's such no. a shame. We got them in the real world, just not in the anime. So we could just blast for all these. Akiza Izaniski. Her race is the... Yeah, her name is kind of rough to pronounce. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that that her, her last name is a little rough one to pronounce. Even then, I could be pronouncing it. I've always pronounced it Izinski, but there's definitely been debate on how it's pronounced. Synchro Fire Monster. Black Rose. Black Rose. I wish it was Fire. Who has the effects that when it is summoned to the field, just destroys everything. Blows it all up. And this is perfect as her ace because it is a perfect representation of how she feels about herself. She's got like these psychic powers. She hurts those around her. What does the Black Rose Dragon do when it's on the field? Destroys it everything. Literally everything around it. So it's perfect. But this monster also has a second secret effect people seem to forget about, which is once per turn, you can banish one plant monster stuff from your grave, target one defense position monster your opponent controls, change it to attack, and if you do, it's attack becomes zero until the end of the turn. Luna, her ace is the- Man, this, this has been banned for a hot minute though. This is actually one of those that like, yeah, people definitely slept on Ancient Fairy for a hot minute and now it's just banned. The Light Dragon, Ancient Fairy Dragon. It has the effect to special summon a level four or lower monster in the hand, and you can also blow up all field spell cards in the field spell zones. Then after you destroy them, you gain a thousand life points. Then you can add any field spell you want from your deck to your hand that has a different name than the field spells destroyed. Now oh, you know, definitely fair. Like back in the day, right? It's like, man, like, I mean, it's okay. But this is one of those that as the form I got faster, as the game got faster, as the power level and power creep set in, right? Like... God, Ancient Fairy does a lot. Luna has a twin brother, Leo. I thought it was at zero. actually changes over the course of the series. Early on, it starts out as Power Tool Dragon. This is before he's officially a... Is it actually? That's a really good question, actually. Is it... Did it get off the ban list? I was under the impression that it was still banned. Yes, we're doing this live on stream. <laughs> no, I'm very curious. I'm pretty sure it's still banned. No, it's not. Chaos Ruler, the Chaotic Magical Dragon, Ib, the World Chalice, Justicar, and Tempest Edition are all currently banned. Damn, when did this come back to one? That's neat. I actually didn't know that. Fair enough. 
Powertool is an Earth Machine monster. Since it isn't a dragon, it's not really a part of the sign of dragons. But, but life it has is. the ability to pick three equipped is spells from the deck. Your opponent picks one of them. You add that one back to your hand and you shuffle the rest back into the deck. I remember these tins when these tins came out. Oh man, I got that. Oh, God, I remember Yu-Gi-Oh tins used to be just absolute bomb. I remember buying so many of the Destiny Hero Plasma ones. I don't have any of those copies. Uh, didn't Rainbow Dragon get a tin too, I think? I thought it, thought it did. Maybe it did. I didn't have money at the time, so I didn't buy. But like, no, nah, like Power Tool, I thought it, it it somehow turned into life stream. So I thought that would be technically the signer variant, but this would be the extender. This would be the, the, the ace. Then if this card would be destroyed while well, has an equipped spell equipped to it, you can destroy the equipped spell instead. However, when he became a true signer, his monster's shell was revealed. The metallic skin came off and the real ace was revealed. Life stream dragon. This monster has the effect that when it is synchro summoned, it can make the life points of the wielder become 4,000. Wow. With it on the field, you take no effect damage. And if this card would be destroyed, kind of like... you can actually banish an equipped spell in the graveyard instead to keep it on the field. Ooh. What's a bit weird about this monster, however, is you actually have to use Power Tool Dragon as one of the materials to summon it to the field. So yeah. you could say that Power Tool is still his ace and Livestream is his boss monster. That'd be the however, one. I would say that the ace monster transferred over to live stream dragon since it is actually the true form of power tool dragon crow Hogan. now crow is an interesting man like i know the signer dragon variant right that's gonna be uh blackwing dragon right but is it wouldn't it be something like armor master would actually be his ace technically God, I've been, Armor Master is wild to fight back in the day. Case, because I know it's not the official thing that happened in the series, but originally Crow was actually meant to be a villain. He wasn't really meant to be one of the main signer cast. He was going to be a dark signer. With that in mind, thinking of Crow Kinda as a, wild. an antagonistic force, his ace monster makes more sense as a villain boss monster, as his original ace monster was Blackwing Armor Master. Its effect is that it cannot be destroyed by battle. You take no battle damage from attacks involving this card, and at the end of the damage step, if this card attacked a monster, you can place one wedge counter on that monster. You can remove all wedge counters from your opponent's monsters, the attack and defense of those monsters that had wedge counters. This is all false. This uh, <laughs> we, we, have, we have cap in the chat. The, so it, was this just uh, fan speculation then in regard to Crow potentially being a antagonist? I'd have to see sourcing on it. I'd be very interested to see the argument. Him being a dark signer was actually false. Okay, so we're gonna we're, we'll just debunk that for as uh, just internet hijinks, baseless speculation, if you will. It is a very interesting segment at the very least, and like I can kind of see. Like, looking at Armor Master, I mean, I can kind of see the aesthetic that they're going for and how that would fit. But if this is based on speculation, I will, you know, support unless there is citation that comes out. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll, we'll say spec based on speculation, barring citation that this was actually the original design intent, if that makes sense. Monsters that had wedge counters becomes zero until the end of the turn. That's quite a durable ace monster to have with very detrimental effects to the opponents. This feels like a villain kind of boss. However, he does have another monster, and that is the Sina Dragon, Black Winged Dragon. This monster's effects, if you would take damage from a card effect, place one black feather counter on this card instead. This card loses 700 attack for each black feather counter on it. Once per turn, you can remove all black feather counters from this card, target one face up monster your opponent controls. That target loses 700 attack for each black feather counter removed. And if it does, inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack lost. I hmm. think it's safe to say Blackwing Dragon is probably his real ace monster. However, deep down in my heart, I think it's Armor Master, but I'll let you all be. I think it is Armor Master. If I had to give a which one I would weight it on with my limited knowledge, I would still say it would be Armor Master because Blackwing Dragon came later and Armor Master is a black wing. It is not black wing dragon. It is black winged dragon. With a choice. What do you think? Relevant wording. Let me know. So if those were the signers, let's take a look next at the dark signers. There are seven dark signers. Each one of the dark signers wields a earthbound immortal card. The easy answer would be- The easy answer is yes, each of the earthbound immortals technically. To say, oh, all their ace monsters are the earthbound immortal. Done. I'm gonna say no. All the earthbound immortals yeah. are their boss cards. These yeah. are the cards that they wanna get out to end the duel. However, 
underneath their dark signer hoods is a, a person a person with their own yeah like how carly yes has the uh was it also is it also the pisu the uh carly's one right the hummingbird but that but she has a deck that leads to it uh is it Roman? Yeah, he has like what Sun Dragon, Inti, uh, Inti, and Moon Dragon Kia or whatever. Personality and preferences, and I think they have their own Ace monsters underneath their Earth Animals. Hundred Eyes Dragon, yeah. And these are what I think they are. Rex Goodwin. His Ace oh, is Rex. surprisingly two monsters that work together: Sun, Sun and Moon. Dragon Inti and Moon Dragon Quilla. In I'm gonna take actually remembering those because like the last time I've actually seen these, aside from opening random packs, was like Yu-Gi-Oh! Chan like. World Championship, like 2000, like what, six, seven, something like that. It's been a hot minute since we've actually seen these. So I'll take randomly remembering them. I, I will take that. Quilla. In the anime, these work a little bit better as well because one is a synchro monster and the other is a dark synchro. The two. When are we. <laughs> Konami, when are we getting dark synchro, huh? When, when, when are we getting dark synchro, Konami? <laughs> I mean, technically, technically. Ixy kind of take that spot because they are on the opposite side. They have a black frame. Yeah, we're, ne we're never getting Dark Synchro. I mean, that's the easy answer, right? But I, I can meme. I, I can hope. I can hope, like, we will get clear support. Like, clear Vice Dragon, clear World. We, I can hope we'll get clear support, even though we'll never get clear support. I, I don't know. I don't know, actually. Because we're getting new U Bell support. And that was kind of the last thing I thought we would actually, like, ever get. Because, I mean, you know. We, we don't even have an air hummingbird. You just, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like there's an air Neos somewhere, but I just, I can't, I can't find it. I don't remember an air Neos ever existing. And if you get the joke, kudos to you. If you don't, don't worry. There's not, there's no, there's nothing called air Neos. There's never been an air Neos. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> So, I don't know, maybe we'll get clear support at some point. It's cool to see things like this, though. Synchro. The two might be a reference to himself and his brother, or the fact that he possesses light and dark. The same as his brother. His brother was originally a dark signer and a signer. He had the good mark and the bad mark all together. And then after Rex Goodwin chopped off his brother's arm, he took his arm, stuck it on his own arm. Then he, too, had a good signer mark and a bad signer mark. So... This is so metal. Why have I never actually finished 5Ds? I kind of need to track down copies of the discs now. That's probably that duality in there, if I had to guess. Moon Dragon's effect is, if it is attacked, Rex gains life points equal to half the attack of that monster. If it is destroyed, one Sun Dragon Inti in the grave is summoned to the field. Yeah. Sun Dragon's effect is, if it is destroyed by battle, the monster that destroyed it is also destroyed and damage is dealt equal to half the attack of that monster. Once during the standby phase of the next turn after this card on the field was destroyed, special summon one Moon Dragon Cooler from the... It doesn't even have a bad stat line. It just has a... Doesn't it doesn't require, like... Ant Ascator or something like that doesn't actually require it to uh, actually go into play. Like, it's so... These are always so weird as Synchro cards. Like, they have really good stat lines, though. He's so buff. Him and Thelonious Viper, I feel, could have a very good uh, very good fisticuffs fight. The grave. Yeah, Fire Roman Fan, uh, Fire Ascator. Rex's yeah. brother, his ace, is Underground Arachnid. Yeah, Why? oh yeah, yeah. Well, he has the mark of the spider. His deck focuses all around spiders. He can take control of people with his spiders, and... I think he just likes spiders. Yeah, this card's effect Twitter. was, if it attacked, the opponent can use spells or traps in response. You can select one face-up monster the opponent controls and equip it to this card. If this card would have been destroyed by battle, you can destroy the monster equipped to this card instead. Now, I need to go back and watch the episodes to refresh if this was ever mentioned. The Wii Shop channel theme. Oh my god, it's so good! Thank you, TGS Anime! In the anime, but I think there's probably the spider's thread parable to do with why he likes this monster so much. If you don't know, it's like a Japanese story where the Buddha, he finds this lily pond, there's a hole, and you can see hell down the bottom. And there's this sinner down there, he's like a robber, and he saves a little spider's life. And the, the Buddha's like, oh, that's pretty cool. This guy might not be all bad. I'll tell you what I'll do. Since he saved a spider, uh, I'll put a spider's thread down into hell and give him an opportunity to escape into paradise up here, if, if he wants to, if he can. Sorry. And the, the robber listening. down there, he sees it, he starts <laughs> climbing up, but then, other people in hell start climbing up the rope. As well. Yeah, I've definitely heard this fable, parable, whatever you want to call it. I've definitely heard of this, which is actually super interesting and actually super neat. My favorite, as somebody that played Legend of the Five Rings, and if if 
no, like literally 99% of you are not going to understand anything about what I'm talking about when I talk about L5R. As somebody, as somebody that is Scorpion Clan, has played Scorpion Clan for at this point a number of years, I started in like Emperor and went through a little bit of Ivory before the game died. So, but I mean, I still have Scorpion Clan shenanigans around me. I played Law of Darkness Dojo. It was interesting. And regardless um they there was the whole thing about i can swim and it was the the scorpion and the frog and the scorpion would be like mr frog it's fine don't worry about it it's fine and then the scorpion stings the frog and both of them drown and the scorpion's just like it's in my nature i love these things they're so good well he's kind of worried that the rope's gonna snap and he just selfishly doesn't want them to come up with him since it's his opportunity to escape so he's just trying to kick them all off time to get down and of course the spider web breaks not because there was too many people on the thread but because he started to become petty and sort of showed that he didn't really deserve to be saved yeah so you can make that case with roman goodwin he did activate the nrd destruction that blew everything up so maybe he's trying to atone for that or something so something along with that misty treadwell her race is the dark dragon Dragon Queen of Tragic Endings. I forgot this existed. Why this monster? Well, because her life is very tragic. And I think she wants a monster and an entire deck to represent that. Because the way you get this monster out is you have to have three continuous spells on the field. The three spells she actually uses to get this card out are her sad story continuous spells. These are Atrocious Day, Sorrowful Memories, and Unwavering Truth. But it's because her brother was psychic. She went to the psychic school of witchcraft and wizardry that <laughs> Saya and Ekiza yeah, yeah. were at and took them there. Uh, he got tortured to death. That kind of made Misty snap and sort of go a bit mad and just want to punish people. She thought she had to punish Akiza, but it was actually Soya. This monster's effect is when this card inflicts battle damage, your opponent sends one card from their hand to the graveyard. You can draw one. Every time I see Akiza, I just see Kalan from Code Geass. Like, I can't unsee it. One card. During the standby phase, if this card is in the grave, you can send one face of continuous spell you control to the grave. Special summon this card from the grave. Devak. With the mark of the monkey, he's obviously going to wield Z-Man the Ape King. It's oh! Oh! Oh, I forgot about him. Oh, there are... Oh. Oh, I remember all the memes that were said at game shops that I cannot repeat on stream. Oh, man. That was... Oof, I do not encourage comments on clarifying what exactly I'm referencing, but man, that was. Wow. No, no, wait, that's that. Yeah, no, we're moving on. <laughs> its effect is if it attacks, the opponent can activate any spells or traps. When an opponent's monster declares an attack, you can select that monster and send one monster from your hand to your side of the field to the graveyard to negate the attack. Carly Carmine. Now, Kali's ace actually changes throughout the course of the series. Before she turns into a dark signer, her ace monster is Fortune Fairy Chi. Yes, that is a level six normal monster with absolutely no effect. It's uh, That's absolutely just ballin'. <laughs> if you're ever having a bad day, if you're ever feeling useless, at least you're not a level six earth normal monster with zero attack and zero defense. Summon Skull would like to have a word with your life points. Flavor text is kind of cool, though. It has a fortune on it. The fortune reads, Drawing this card means your fortune today is absolutely awful. Your lucky number is six. Your lucky Definitely color is a meme black. card. Your lucky item is a pair of leather shoes. You're giving your rivals a big head start. Come on. So I mean, if you summon that in an attack position with a tribute, you are giving your opponents a real big head start. <laughs> Jeez. No, but I actually really love things like this. Like we have, uh, what was it Pandemonium? Pandemonium plays with what archetype? It's on the tip of my tongue. Archfiends. Arch. Uh, yeah, because Summon Skull was also retroactively added into Archfiend because of translation issues. Um. Yeah. No, Archfiends are just chess pieces. Des uh, what we had like what Desrek Archfiend, Archfiend Queen, Archfiend King, right? Something like things like that. Archfiends are just chess. We had uh, Arcana. The Arcana Force archetype, Arcana Force Zero, the Fool, Arcana Force Seven, the Chariot, Arcana Force Twenty One, the World. They're just tarot cards. Arcana Force, I can't remember. I think it was like seventeen or something. The Hanged Man, right? Mmm. They're just tarot, which I love. And like, it's so weird because you have such cool concepts like that that are just kind of locked to like really subpar archetypes, if that makes sense. So. Yeah, that's always a little distressing for me because, like, yeah, they suck. It, it, that's that's the, the problem. I wish they were better. But, I mean, I don't know. If we ever get a card that, like, 
So there used to be a card in the Naruto CCG. So there used to be a Konoichi deck. There used to be a specifically a kimono deck, right? You had like Anko kimono, Hinata kimono. You had Tsunade kimono, Shizune kimono, right? It was a kimono deck. And a lot of what fo- what it focused on was it had like uh, weird flip effect stuff like that. Flip flip coins if heads do do thing, right? But I can't remember the name of the card. I'd have to talk to... I haven't talked to S. I'm going to call him S is what his name is. I haven't talked to him in a hot minute, actually. I need to talk to him again. It's been years. Um, S, but I used to know. I used to play it. And there was a mission card. Think like a continuous spell card, right? That uh, you could uh, just declare what the coin flip was. So even if you flipped a... a, a It was like a once per turn kind of thing, right? So if you flip and say... You know, on heads you do discard target and nin- discard a ninja. On tails, discard this ninja. Right? You're like, oh well, it got tails. This mission's effect. I'm gonna make that a heads. Cool. Your ninja's now destroyed. Think of it like that way, right? It's where it's in Yu-Gi-Oh, where you have an archetype where you know you have things like cup of ace. You have the Arcana Force archetype that deals on flips suddenly, and you can make it Arcana specific. That way, you don't make cup of ace literally a pot of greed with extra steps, right? So it'd be a way to help fix the archetype, but I mean, I don't know. Chance is always weird, and just because it would make Arcana Force good, being able to designate coin flips inside of a game, you know, might break other aspects of the game, and other decks might absolutely just go out wild. It's like, well, my Arcana Force deck could use Pot of Greed. Why, why, you know, why isn't Pot of Greed back at one? Because Pot of Greed should never come back at one. We play literally worse versions of Pot of Greed. And we happily play them because they're still so good. <laughs> That's my rants on Pot Agree for the day. So with this bad fortune, why is this monster her ace? I actually just believe it's just because it just looks like her. It's like the mirror image of her. And it, I guess it kind of represents her in a way. Kinda. But after she becomes the Dark Sign, it gets a big upgrade and becomes the Fortune Lady Earth. Oh, I forgot it about gains this. Yeah. Defense equal to its level times 400. During each of the standby phases, increase the level of this card by one. When this card level increases, inflict 400 damage to your opponents. I'll be honest, any of the Fortune Ladies or yeah. Fortune Fairies could have been an ace monster. Yeah. Maybe it was one of the good ones that were ace. But I just think this one makes sense. No, no, that's actually a good thing to bring up. Jar of Greed is not better than Pot of Greed, and I can actually tell you why. One, Jar of Greed is, still, is a net zero in card economy because Pot of Greed is not actually a plus two. Pot of Greed is actually a plus one. You're having to play the Pot of Greed to draw two. So say if you have five cards in your hand, you play Pot of Greed, you go down to four. Pot of Greed's effect activates, resolves, you draw two, you suddenly go five, six. So you're at six. So it is a plus one. Jar of Greed is not a plus. In fact, it is a break even, right? You have to, out of a five card hand, set a Pot of Greed, and then it will only draw you one. So you go from five to four, four to five, right? However, because of how fast Yu-Gi-Oh is now, and because of how really the game is played, unless you're a trap card with absolute bonkers potential, with, I mean, like Paleozoics, you see a lot of success with those. Infinite Impermanence is my favorite trap card in the game. I will play 37 cards plus Infinite Impermanence place that, right? It's how I do uh, some of my deck building, because Infinite Impermanence is actually bonkers, right? It's, unless you're specifically setting slots aside for things like Mirror Force, Magic Cylinder, things like that. I mean, traps are really just too slow in terms of a tempo. And do you would you rather, I don't know, get the chance to resolve three rush recklessly? Not rush recklessly. Um, whatever the trap card is that you draw two, but you skip like your next draw phase or something like that. What is it? It's not rush recklessly. That's a quick play spell card. Anyways, right? It just doesn't work the same way. I would argue something like desires, prosperity. I guess desires might be more of a better equation there. Desires would be way better than Jar Greed. Reckless Greed, thank Grieger. you. Now, Grieger had two potential ace monsters that I'm actually not too sure which one I would class as the ace and which I would class as an ace boss or something like that. His monsters are Flying Fortress, Skyfire, and Dark Strike Fighter. I'm going to go with Skyfire, I think. Mm, mm, Dark Strike Fighter, you were banned for a number of years. I remember that. Oh, God. I never played it at full power, but I remember when that got banned. Wow, that's been a hot minute. Does Graceful Charity discard for cost, or does that actually just discard to discard? Like, is it discard by effect or cost? For the choice. This just seems like a, an ace monster card that you would want to have. And I, yeah. this is the one that he would have chose. Its effect is it cannot be special summoned except with the effect of summon reactor SK. 
Once per turn, you can send one card from your hand to the graveyard to destroy one card your opponent controls. Once during each of your opponent's turns, you can activate one of the following. Yes, I know it's draw three, discard two, but there's actually a difference, and that's actually why Burning Abyss and Shadal is such a debate. So, Burning Abyss will always activate when they are sent to the graveyard. So that's why Karma Cut, Phoenix Wing, Wing Blast, and stuff like that worked. Whereas stuff like Dark World and stuff like Shadal have to be sent off of an effect. So things like uh, like, ha like card destruction, right? Things that will not discard for cost. And that's the difference. I, I think Graceful Charity is... No, Graceful Charity is effect. It has to be. I think it's a... F I don't know. Someone would have to clarify. Effects. When your opponent normal summons or special summons a monster, destroy it and inflict 800 damage. When your opponent sets a card, destroy it and inflict 800 damage. Kalin Kessler. His ace monster, I would say, him. is between Infinity Dune Dragon and 100 Eyes Dragon. I'm going to give it to 100 Eyes. I think since 100 Eyes Dragon, as cool as it is, it supports the Earth and Immortal boss monster. In the anime, you can select any card and add it to your hand, whereas in the real world, it can add any Earth and Immortal card. I'd say it's more support for them and not indicative of Kalin Kessler's true ace. So I'm actually going to say it's the Infinity Doom Dragon is his ace. Its effect is once per turn, if you have no cards in your hand, you can select one monster your opponent controls, destroy that monster, and inflict damage to your opponent equal to half its attack. This card cannot attack during the same turn you activate this effect. The fact that this monster has Infinity... I'm having to actually look this up in the background. Opponent cannot activate appropriate after you activate Graceful Charity. Oh, this is in response to that. Right, I, I, I'm aware that how it's worded is draw three cards, discard two. I think it discards for effect. Yes, discards for Grace of Charity are not for cost. The Shadow Monster effects would be uh, triggered by it, using the word that the effect would actually trigger due to, the, uh, due to that effect. Okay, that's, that's relevant wording. Like, if it was something like... God. What was I just playing? I was playing Branded. Like Albaz, right? Like Fallen of Albaz where you normal or special summon it, discard one card, and then you can super poly, right? It's, that is discard for cost. So that's a little different. Phoenix Wing Wing Blast, right? Where you're, or Karma Cut, where you're having to discard a card for cost. That does not trigger Shadal or Dark Worlds. I've seen its name as well, and it relies on no cards being in Kalin's hand. It just makes sense, really, for it to be his ace monster. Moving on next, we have Team Ragnarok. For Team Ragnarok, I have no idea who these people are. Each one of them wields a Nordic god as the oh, these guys. monster, and each one I've of these heard monsters of them. has its own unique effect and its own ability to bring itself back and do something. For Dragon, he wields Thor, Lord of the Azir, who can blanket wipe every single monster on the field and negate their effects. Also, during the end phase, if this card was destroyed and sent to the grave, you can banish a Nordic Beast Tuna from the grave to special summon it back to the field and inflict 800 damage to the opponent. Brodor! He wields Loki, Lord of the Azir, who has the ability that if a spell or trap is activated, you can negate the activation of that and destroy it. During the end phase, if this card was 3300, 3k is not a bad stat line. Destroyed, you can banish one Nordic Alpha Tuna, special summon this card, and if you do, target one trap in your grave, add it to your hand. Haldor, he wields the big bad Odin, father of the Azir. Its effect can make it immune to all spells and traps. During the end phase, if this space of card was destroyed, you can banish one Nordic Ascendant Tuna from your grave to special summon it back to the field. If it's summoned this way, you can draw one card. Sticking with the teams, we also have Team Unicorn. Team Unicorn each wields a unicorn monster with an increasing number of horns, levels, and potential power, really. For Andre, mm -hmm. he wields the level 5 single horned Unicorn. Its effect is once per turn during the main phase, you can select one face up monster your opponent controls. It loses 500 attack for each monster you control until the end phase. During I mean, trying to, that's a pause. I was, I'm like Thunder Unicorn. I'm like, is that, that's not Thunder Dragon archetype. No, it, it's Thunder Dragon. Doesn't list a Thunder monster because that would actually be a little nutty. In the turn this effect is activated, no other monsters can attack except this one. Brio, he wields the level seven two horned Voltic Bicorn. Its effect is, if this card is destroyed by your opponent's card, either by battle or card effect, both players send the top seven cards of their deck to the grave. Uh -huh. G. He wields the level eight Lightning Tricorn. Three horns. Its effect is... Amazing. One, two, and three. It's amazing. If it is destroyed by the opponent, you can select one Thunder Unicorn or Voltic Bicorn in your graveyard and special summon it. Team New World is made up of one person split into three points in their life 
becoming three characters. Nice. Each one wields an ace monster that basically just hates synchro monsters. We start <laughs> first with Lester. His ace is Mechlord Emperor Skeel. It has a very. I was wondering where the Mechlords came in. Okay, so this is like late. 5Ds. Long effect, but basically it just does something to Synchro Monsters, okay? His older version, Primo, his ace is Mechlord Emperor Weasel. Weasel? Weasel. I think it's Weasel. This also does something to Synchro Monsters. And the oldest four, Jacob, his ace is Mechlord Emperor Grinnell, which also has an effect to do with ruining a Synchro player's day. But when you take these three people and you smush them all together, you get their combined form, Aporia. Now, this guy has two potential ace monsters. There is Mechlord, Astro, Dragon, Asterisk, and Mech... God, I remember these. It's been a hot minute, hasn't it? I don't think Mechlords have ever been any sort of... I think one of them, wasn't it like Weisel or something, was actually somewhat competitive? But, like, the actual archetype itself was kind of garbo. Mechlord, Astro, Mech, and Nickel. Both of them have really devastating abilities, and both of them are very, very strong. And I had to give it to one of them. It's going to be Mechanical. It just looks like Aporia, right? Yeah, so it just makes sense for kinda. this to be his ace. And since I skipped the three previous effects, we might as well go over this one. Must be special summoned by sending three Mechlord monsters from your hand to the graveyard. Once per turn, you can target one Synchro monster your opponent controls. Equip that target to this card. This card gains attack equal to the combined attack of the monsters equipped to it by this effect. Once per turn, during your standby phase, you can send one of those equipped monsters to your graveyard to inflict damage to your opponent equal to the monster's original attack. Yeah. But you cannot conduct your battle phase the turn you activate this effect. Effect. Paradox. While Paradox steals the ace monsters of loads of people throughout time, he has two unique, well, he has three unique monsters to him. Malefic Parallel Gear, Malefic Paradox Dragon, and Malefic Truth Dragon. However, the monster that is his ace out of these three is Paradox Dragon. Its effect is when it is summoned, he can select a synchro monster in either player's graveyard and special summon it to his field. I mean, I think Malefics would have been cool if they were actually given proper support. Like, I think they were a really cool archetype and they were a really cool concept. And that's, I mean, kind of Yu-Gi-Oh's thing, right? I mean, you're going to have decks that are better than others. Like, you'll have Kashdera that's better. You'll have Dragon Rulers that are just sheer value just sheer gas right you'll have teledad you get in the teledad format right and historically right you just have cards that are just better than other cards it's how the game is played and then you're gonna have you know cards that are not as good right i mean crystal beasts aren't exactly the best deck out there like let's be real if you put crystal beasts up against an aggro deck i mean you're gonna have a bad time so i mean <laughs> if malefic world isn't on the field this card isn't either. Oh, and of course, we have the big bad, Zone. While his ultimate boss monster is settled on the ultimate Time Lord, there is a lower level one that I think I would class as his ace monster, and uh -huh. that is Meteon, the Time Lord. Like all Time Lords, if you control no monsters, it can be normal summoned to the field without attributes. It cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects, and you take no damage from attacks involving this monster. Yeah, At the end I of the battle phase, if this card battled, return as many monsters on the field as possible to the hand. And if you do, inflict 300 damage to your opponent for each card. <laughs> the face, it's so good. Card returned. Once per turn during the standby phase, shuffle this card into the deck. Team Tayo. They share a combined ace monster of Zushin the Sleeping Giant. I've heard that this is... I don't know if this was filler or not, but I've heard of this. Because this is where Zushin the Sleeping Giant comes from. And I've heard that this is actually a really good, like... Couple, I think it's like a couple episodes, right? It's really good, I hear. Team Catastrophe. They also share a combined ace monster, which is Hook the Hidden Knight. Its effect isn't that important. What's more important is the fact that they use this monster to cheese wins by, while it's invisible, putting its hook into dual runners' wheels to make them crash and get disqualification. <laughs> Very naughty. <laughs> For the rest of the cast, we have so Bruno, bad. whose ace is TG Blade Blaster. Tetsu right. Trudge, whose Throughout ace about is TG's. Guardian. Chevy LeBlanc, whose ace is Chevalier de Fleur, who probably in modern days would have probably got Baron de Fleur. As yeah, no, okay. I was like, isn't this for Baron? Yeah, Baron would be a extension of that. It's a true ace. Oh, she has a butler, by the way. Uh, he has an ace as well. Ellsworth, his ace is Driven Daredevil. Hunter Pace, his ace is Skull Flame. It's got an upgraded form. Wow, I completely forgot about Skull Flame. That look at look at the quality on that. That is an old card. But that's his boss monster. We'll cover that in the future. Saya, 
His ace is Thought Ruler Archfiend. I've actually always loved Thought Ruler Archfiend because I I've, I've didn't know the character who had it. But mechanically, I have absolutely always adored Thought Ruler Archfiend. Linden, his ace and favorite card is the Time Wizard. How cool is that? This card was given to him by his father because he just loves clocks. He's got a clock themed deck yeah. and everything. So it's kind of cool that his ace is a, a Time Wizard card. Kind of cool. Morton, his ace is Gatling Ogre. Kaz, his ace is Chaos King Archfiend. Tenzen, out of all of his hidden treasure <laughs> monsters, I guess if I had to pick an ace for it, I'd say it's Crystal Skull. There's just something about it being a rock that just makes me laugh. I love this. I didn't know that this card existed. Oh my god. <laughs> what? Yeah, I just thought about Dan Aykroyd's Crystal Skull Vodka too. During the end phase, it'll take any effect damage this turn. You either add your hands for some one rock. Oh my god. Can we add this to like the Garbage Lord Self TK deck? I feel this would be right at home with it, right? <laughs> God, I, I feel like I feel like I'm going to get a play. I'm going to come into a play set of this randomly, like after doing this and laughing at this, I'm definitely going to come into a play set of this randomly or I'll just build a 40 card pile of nothing but crystal skull and just walk around just like flashing crystal skull cards at people. <laughs> Bolt Tanner, Giant Ushi Oni and Lazar. Lazar, probably Jester Lord. And probably. there's probably a few more characters we could do this for, but that's kind of the main cast in Yu Gi Oh! 5Ds. Want to learn more about. If I see one, any one of you putting Crystal Skull Yu Gi Oh! cards on artwork of me or on memes of me, I don't know. I really can't do anything, but I just expect this now. <laughs> like, Crystal Skull just got me in the weirdest way. Sign the Dragon Ace Monsters. Well, I have a video all about that or would you want to watch one of the previous episodes you can do that over here instead thank you all for watching everybody catch you later god no that was great i actually enjoyed that i need to go back through five days i need to actually go through and finish five days because i feel like that's gonna have a lot of cool things in it i feel like this gonna have a lot of cool story elements plot elements and we even have crystal skull which apparently was a card i didn't know i needed how much are they on tcg player let me <laughs> Like, what a random thing for me to latch on to. Garbage Lord and, like, Crystal Skull. Like, <laughs> what? what? <laughs> I just... It's so... I forgot Chronomaly's had one. Oh, it's like four cents on. <laughs> it's from Battle Battles of Legend. <laughs> oh my god, it's too good. Let me know what you thought of this. Let me know if you found this amazing. Let me know if... Crystal Skull made you laugh as much as it made me laugh. Uh, yeah, do you think that everything was on point here? Do you think I should watch 5Ds? Let me know in the comments, and I will see you in the next one.